Live now. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our council meeting, first council meeting of May. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order at seven o'clock and uh, with the adoption of the agenda. Is there any addition? Madam Mayor, administration has no additions. Thank you. Any additions from council? Okay, could I have someone move to adopt the agenda? I'll move to adopt the agendas presented. Councillor Anderson, all in favor? Carried. Um, no public hearings, presentations, or delegations. Uh, you've had your uh, council minutes. Is there any errors or omissions in the minutes? Seeing none, could I please? Oh, sorry, under the council committee reports for myself and Councillor Forrest, the April 21st uh, was not a meeting with Lions Tooth Energy. That was a follow up to the April 15th meeting with uh, the Alberta Energy Regulator and uh, um, the Minister of Energy's office. But I'll move the minutes without amendment. All in favor? Carried. Um, for my report, because I've been so busy, I didn't get it out to you guys, sorry. Um, on April 28th, uh, I attended Ready, and we covered the draft report for our historical, cultural, and Indigenous tourism. That's part of our CARES grant. Uh, and the report outlined different sites and opportunities for tourism in the Mackenzie region. Um, the Move Up magazine, which everybody gets free in their mailbox, um, will feature the proposed pea processing facility in, uh, in our area. And uh, our, our reports for the CARE projects are due May 31st. And we've hired a company called New Harvest to complete a new web page for the Ready um, group. April 30th, um, I attended an F MFTA meeting, Mackenzie Frontier Tourism Association. Once again, we reviewed the draft tourism report. And to date, there are 67 new members for, for uh, the Mackenzie Frontier Tourism. May 4th, uh, SETI meeting and uh, at the SETI meeting it was decided that subcommittees will prepare narrative powerpoints to share with councils so that we can uh, receive feedback and uh, questions about each of the committee subcommittees and the subcommittees are the waterline wasteland uh, wastewater infrastructure the joint regional emergency plan and the multi-use evacuation center. Uh, May 4th, I attended a town hall meeting um, with uh, Kenny Madhu Nixon and Fuhrer. The discussion mainly centered around campsites opening up, a lot about hair salons opening up and different, uh, different air, uh, things that they're gonna do to social, well, uh, adhere to what the province has put out and a lot about dance studios as well. So that was the main focus of the meeting. And the ministry's basic feedback was, you know your business best, you know, proceed with a plan and let us know what that plan is. May 8th, uh, we had another lovely seven hour Zoom meeting on Bistu Lake Task Force. Um, we reviewed the recommendations reports, the outcomes, and we did some discussion on land shifts, which took about two hours. And finally, the government decided to scrap that idea because the land shifts to us without the reports meant very little. And the land shifts reminded us very much of um, the drawings on the maps that we saw here at the... Uh, at the uh, Mirage when we had our meeting with 1,500 people. 
So we will be having another meeting before this report goes up to the minister and becomes public. If there's any questions, I will try to answer them. Seeing none, could I have someone please accept my report? I'll accept your report. Who was that? Councillor Jessamine. Okay, Councillor Jessamine. Thank you very much. All in favor? Carried. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. April 28th, I attended the same Ready AGM um, meeting as the mayor and then followed by the uh, board meeting thereafter. And then on April, or sorry, May the 4th, also attended the same uh, city working group meeting. Any questions? Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Anderson. April 29th, I attended the uh, High-level municipal library meeting. Uh, and that's all I have. Okay. Um, have you had a chamber meeting at all? No, nothing at all. So do no, we do we know anything about town cleanup? Well, other than it was slated to go on in June, and I didn't, I'm not sure whether we're going to continue or whether that'll be one of the ones that gets postponed. So is there any talk <clears throat> of perhaps doing it the same as last year where people just took their own clean, you know, their yards and stuff and put it into um, dumpsters? I've had a lot of questions, that's why I'm asking. Madam Mayor? Yes? Uh, we have had some conversations with the Chamber and we're working with them right now. We can probably have an answer for you for next Monday or Tuesday. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Um, Councillor Forrest. Uh, no reports at all. Thank you. Councillor Jessamon. No reports at this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Morgan. Uh, April 29th, I attended the same high level municipal library board meeting that Councillor Anderson attended. Um, our 29 finances are in order, finally. They are disappointing to say the least. Uh, we've got a meeting scheduled on the 14th with the director of the library to go over it and to figure out what happened and how we can stop it happening again. And then April 30th, I attended the same Mackenzie Frontier tourism meeting that the mayor attended. So what's the matter with the finances? Or we were that? <laughs> um, we overspent. Let's let's put it that way. Okay. The the excess or the amount we overspent has been covered by what we had in reserves, so we are at our back at net zero, but we had to take some money out of reserves. You didn't deplete your reserves, did you? Not entirely. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Councillor Welke. I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Could I have someone please move council committee reports? So moved. Councillor Forrest, all in favor? Carried. So the next we will move to the administrative reports, beginning with the actions from council meetings. Is there any questions on the action list? Okay, could we have someone move to accept the action list then? I'll move the action list. Councillor Morgan. All in favor? Carried. The capital project list. Is there any questions? I have a question for uh, Director Straub. 
Um, okay. so is the new street sweeper actually going to show up on Friday? Is that a firm date? <laughs> I, uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. And I mm -hmm. talked to them last Tuesday, and they should be here uh, on the 18th, which was a holiday. So I'm assuming they're going to show up on the 19th. So should be here next week sometime. And how long between when it arrives and when it can go into service? We have three days of in-service training, and part of that will be working in the streets right away. So it should be the same week. Perfect. Kudos on the start to the spring cleanup already, but it'll be nice to see that new unit here. Yes, we are certainly looking forward to the extra sweeper. Thank you. Um, is there any other questions on the capital project list? Okay, could I have someone accept the capital project list then? I'll move the capital projects list. Councillor Anderson, all in favor? Carried. The finance report, uh, Ms. Zanko. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, if, if anybody has any questions, I will try to answer them. Um, otherwise, I did provide uh, the usual monthly report and the quarterly report for the first quarter in 2020. Um, I really appreciate all your notes there that made uh, reading it like so easy. I'm glad. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any questions on on the financial report? None. Okay. Could I have someone accept the financial report then? I'll accept it. Councillor Welke, all in favor? Carried. So the monthly um, the monthly reports to council. Uh, Cao McCaskill, are you going to handle that? Madam Mayor, I think we'll just leave that. If council has any questions, please feel free to answer the appropriate director. I have one question. Okay, Councillor Welke. <clears throat> Under. Uh, the communications, can you hear me? I'm sorry, kind of flipping between my um, two applications here. Can everyone still hear me? Yes, we can yep. hear you. Okay. Um, under the communications section, the first paragraph, it says the town's Facebook page has been averaging seven something. It just, it just ends. Is there a, a statistic that? there that's relevant? I think Bill is on. Hi. Yeah. Uh, sorry. The uh, the number is about seventy two hundred. Seventy two hundred. Uh, uh, per day. Per day. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions on the monthly administrative reports? Could I have someone move to accept those reports then? I'll move it for you. Deputy Mayor, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Carried. So under new business, um, we're going to ask uh, um, Rodney to uh, go over our emergency planning orientation. It seems to be a good time to refresh council on all the roles and different areas. So the screen will be going blank and Rodney will be putting up his, um, his emergency planning orientation. And uh, if you have questions on it, please write them down because he won't be able to hear us. Just write them down and we will discuss them at the end. Good, thanks, Madam Mayor. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right, just give me a second and I'm going to share our screen here and okay. get it up and going.
turn it into a crack down on freedom of assembly. Not only for the human rights of citizens, but also for other religious activities. I think this is a gross violation of human rights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure. Are you guys seeing the whole screen there? I just can't see what you're seeing. We are yeah, seeing. We... Oh, go ahead, Theo. You. It's, it's your desktop, Rodney. That's what okay, we're saying. Just, uh... If we could just ask counselors to mute their screens. Okay, that's full screen now, Rodney. Thank you. All right, so um, I still can hear you. So yeah, if there is questions, if you want to hold them to the end, that's fine. If uh, if you want to interrupt and ask, uh, feel free. Um, this is a fairly long presentation, so I'm going to try and go through it as fast as I can. Um, but the public is uh, also online with us, so um, I'm sure uh, this would be good orientation for not just council, but the public. So uh, by the Municipal Government Act, there's a requirement for council to review our emergency plan once a year. And... Uh, we decided to do it in a PowerPoint form this year for council just uh, to better present it instead of just going page by page through a binder. So what we're going to go through is just a bit of an understanding of our emergency plan, an update to what changes we have in our municipal emergency plan, and just go over a few learning outcomes, mainly from last year, that I'll kind of discuss throughout the presentation. So the municipal emergency plan works to lay out a foundation uh, for response to emergencies of all types. So it's not just uh, the forest fire one, which is our biggest hazard, but it covers off so many different areas within our plan. But really it's a resource document to uh, direct not just council, but staff as well on where, uh, where we're supposed to be headed with our with emergency planning, uh, what positions and st that staff have, as well as uh, as contacts. So that's kind of the main pur uh, purpose of the plan, um, as well as identifying resources, which uh, frankly, after last year, uh, is now a big job to, we've identified so many more resources that we need to add to our plan. So uh, we're working in on that now. So how does the plan work? It actually separates into uh, five levels of emergency response. So, um, so the new plan, uh, which was developed before the Chuck Egg fire, is based on the Instant Command System. And the Instant Command System, uh, it base, bases uh, its planning on five types of incidents. So I'm gonna go through those types. Uh, type five is your typical day-to-day uh, -day, uh, emergency for ourselves and emergency services. And quite often uh, the public and council and even administration don't even hear about the day-to-day -day calls. Uh, you may hear about the house fire, but this would include a you know, medical emergency vehicle accidents. And they're really just our low impact, short duration incidents that we call type five incidents. And they're managed by the resources that we have uh, in the municipality. So a type four is a little bit bigger of a response. So that would be um, a response that involves mutual aid partners, such as our departments in the county, um, Rainbow Lake uh, and so on. Um, an example of that, probably the, the most recent example would have been the wildfires we had in 2018, um, where uh, in, when we had fires at the Ponton uh, River and Hutch Lake at the same time, and we had our mutual aid partners in uh, from different areas assisting. And it really doesn't go beyond that. Um, during this, we may or may not uh, uh, activate an emergency coordination center, but uh, type four incidents are, are still considered kind of a, a a normal response. So type three incident is a major emergency where a state of emergency has been declared. And usually it's beyond the capability of our local resources and it's a medium to high impact and definitely a longer duration. So the Chuck Egg fire last year was a type three incident and I'll explain why when we get into type two, why it wasn't a type two. But um, uh, type three incidences are, are beyond the capacity of a local municipality would usually um, stretch into the provincial level um, or um, at least into the regional level at the, at the absolute minimum. So type two incident is a, a major emergency um, beyond the capabilities of not just local resources, but even stretching provincial resources. And the, the biggest difference I can explain between a type two incident, which we call Slave Lake and the Fort McMurray wildfires would have been a type two incident in Canada is because of the damage and the amount of uh, long uh, term impact. 
So when you think about the Chuck Egg fire, although we did lose homes in Paddle Prairie, um, there was far more damage and far more loss in Fort McMurray and Slave Lake. And uh, the recovery time was much, much longer. So that would be a type two incident. Type one, and go ahead. Sorry, was that a question? Your, uh, okay, thank you. No, I think we're picking up somebody, somebody in the background. Okay, thank you. So a type one incident, which we have not had in Canada uh, yet, is a major emergency where provincial or national declarations of emergency have occurred. So, um, I mean, the pandemic right now is actually being treated as a type one emergency because it's nationwide. Uh, but when we look at physical incidents versus a medical uh, type emergency, we would be looking at the hurricanes that you see in the United States, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Andrew, um, that have massive impacts over large areas. Uh, those would be your type one incidents. So um, we haven't seen any of those in Canada uh, yet, um, but definitely the, the pandemic is being treated as a type one. So how does our plan work with other municipalities or other plans? So there's a lot of other plans out there that work um, in concert with, with the town plan, including the health region or North, uh, the Alberta Health Services, Mackenzie County, Rainbow Lake, Northern Lights County, industry emergency response plans such as Tolco and Norboard. There was a good example of that during Chuck Egg, um, First Nations, uh, Fort Million School Division, Utilities, and there's many, many others. Um, but there's a lot of coordination between the plans. So it not, may not be necessarily written into the plan, but we're quite often written into everybody else's plan. And that's how uh, a lot of the coordination uh, uh, works. Um, we do have some specific uh, uh, plans syn synchronized with Albert Health Services, specifically our pandemic plan, uh, as well as um, you know the support to the hospital during evacuation and, and that kind of thing. And as council's aware, um, specifically with McKenzie County and Rainbow Lake, we have a regional emergency management bylaw. So those plans, although they're not one regional plan between the three municipalities, there is by bylaw some uh, uh, regional application in terms of assisting each other with emergency coordination centers and so on. And we are embarking on a regional planning initiative with uh, the Denetaw First Nations now. So, um, so lots of uh, synchronization between different plans. Uh, Rodney, it's Jan. I have a quick yep. question. For sure. Um, so the Northwest Alberta Emergency Resource Agreement, is that kind of, does that fit in this aspect of our plan or in our uh, uh, collaborations with our, our neighbors? Absolutely. It, it, it's not a plan, it's an agreement. So it, it's covered okay. off in another section of the plan. That's a great question. But the Northwest uh, Alberta Emergency Resource Agreement covers 29 municipalities and it's a resourcing agreement. So if we need assistance from other municipalities, we can enact that plan. So they would be beyond our regular mutual aid partners like Rainbow Lake or McKenzie County. And it would stretch, oh, okay. uh, stretches as far south actually as uh, Fox Creek and Lac Saint Anne County. Um, oh, okay. So um, it's a huge plan. High Level is actually one of the architects of that, of that resource agreement. Great. And uh, we manage that agreement on behalf of the Northwest. So, um, Chuck Egg uh, utilized the Northwest Regional Agreement. So, um, and that's how we got our initial resources to the community. Was there any activation of uh, assistance during the Peace River flooding from McKenzie County with the town of high level? Um, just out of, uh, so there was two requests from McKenzie County on uh, the flooding. And one was for emergency uh, social services assistance. So housing evacuees, as council's aware, we had evacuees here at high level. I think we still do. Um, and then the second one was strictly a resourcing uh, request that the uh, fire department was covering all fire services on this side of the river while the, while the uh, access to the bridge was closed. So those were the two areas that, okay. that we assisted. Thank you. you bet. Oh, I, I guess I should also mention that we also uh, helped mobilize the Northwest uh, Incident Management Team over to Task Force One to them as well. So uh, we were, uh, we organized that for them. So, um, so we're quickly just going to talk uh, about the school division and some of the other plans. So uh, schools are listed as potential evacuation centers in our plans and uh, they're used if other communities are evacuated into our community. We've had a, a habit of, of using hotels in the past and we found out, especially with Chuck Egg last year, that 
that uh, using hotels for evacuees isn't always the answer. Certainly sometimes it is. And in this case, this year with the floods, that was the best plan, especially with the, the COVID issues that we're dealing with. Um, but, uh, but definitely um, the schools are a big part of our plan. They're also in our utility failure plan uh, because some of the schools have backup power so they can be used as warming centers. So a uh, major event that at the school will have an impact on our municipal emergency plan, such as a school violence incident, a bus accident, fire, et cetera. So uh, we have back and forth uh, resources listed uh, with the school division and ourselves. And uh, we also use the school division as a transportation resource. So Alberta Health Services, um, the mass casualty plan, uh, we have an appendix in our plan for, for mass casualty events. And uh, it's primarily just how we, uh, it's more of an emergency services centered plan, but uh, it works, uh, it's more, the hospital has the bigger portion of that obviously and how we deal with that. Um, we have in past uh, during exercises used our other facilities as um, holding centers when the hospital gets overwhelmed. So as an example, we may use the lobby of the arena or the ice surface of the arena in the summertime if we had a major incident to help care for patients until we can get that overflow into the hospital. So um, there is some, uh, some synchronization between the two, uh, two uh, organizations with regards to that. And then finally, health inspectors are involved in our plan because they have to inspect evacuation centers, temporary morgues, care and feeding centers. Um, they were heavily involved last year during our incident and uh, on the ground, making sure that we were doing everything to make everybody safe. And you can imagine during this uh, part of uh, this year, if we had a major event, the health inspectors would be highly involved because of COVID. Uh, industry, uh, we do resource uh, some uh, equipment and other uh, manpower sometimes from, uh, from Tolco and Norboard. Uh, Tolco specifically because they're right in town. So Tolco was a major resource for us during Chuck Egg last year. They provided some heavy equipment um, and uh, provided lumber to help do our sprinkler line and, and uh, so on. And in the past, uh, when uh, Norboard's ERT was more active, we had used their ERT as a backup in town to assist us with major fires. We don't do that anymore, but that uh, was uh, something that had occurred in the past. Um, utilities. So uh, utility failure is still a key hazard in our plan. Um, now the power is fed from two areas. Uh, we thought until last year, at least, that our, uh, our power was pretty secure. Um, obviously, forest fires uh, have a huge impact on that. But um, uh, we, we've only had, uh, even up to a couple of years ago, we've had uh, threats to natural gas supply. So uh, we do have a gas outage and power outage plan uh, within, our, within our MEP. Um, so I already talked about other municipalities. Um, but uh, just to keep in mind for council, our emergency plan has been activated uh, more times for supporting other communities than it has for um, our own community. So um, high levels used because of its central location uh, in the north as an evacuation center um, for many of the First Nations communities. So we've had, um, over the years that I've been working for the town, we've had uh, Zama, Fox Lake, uh, Garden River, Tall Cree, uh, Keg River, all here in various years uh, evacuate into high level. Um, and we can also be used as a remote emergency operations center for other communities as well. So um, how does our plan sync with other, uh, with, with the other plans federally and provincially? Um, that uh, kind of depends on the incident. So it's not often that we have federal involvement, but often we have provincial involvement. So as an example, uh, the province was on the ground at the very get-go last year during Chuck Egg. Um, they were on the ground fairly quickly this year during the floods. Um, so they, they can bring a lot of resources to the table. Um, they, if it's going to be considered uh, that there's a potential major loss, the province tries to get in early to help with DRP assistance. Um, the federal level is really around uh, military assistance and that only really happens on occasion. So um, it happened, uh, the military was up in high level. Well, they, they were here for a couple of days, but they weren't utilized. Um, but definitely, um, it's not a common thing to have uh, federal assistance. They usually come in at the tail end uh, to assist with recovery. So, so how would town of high level employees be involved? Uh, we use uh, 
We use them in various areas, whether it's assistance with evacuation centers, um, helping with evacuations, uh, transportation, utilities, maintenance, logistics. Um, there's all kinds of different areas that uh, we can use uh, town staff for. Um, it should be noted that every town staff in their employment agreement has a section in there that says they may be requested or required to stay in high level during an emergency. So that's made well aware to all employees during uh, their sign on with the town of high level. And certainly our town staff stepped up last year during Chuck Egg to assist. So, um, so I'm talking a little bit about our emergency coordination center. The title says emergency operations center, but it's officially tall, called an ECC now. Um, so during a type four to type one emergency, the town may activate the emergency coordination center. And our main uh, location of the, uh, of the center is uh, at the town office. So the job of the ECC is to support the emergency and ensure town operations. Um, it is, uh, it is not a command center unless it needs to be. Uh, primarily, the emergency site is often managed by emergency services. So, um, and that depends on, on the incident. Uh, certainly um, now with a, you know, the pandemic plan, um, we don't really have an emergency site. So if we were to um, have a emergency coordination center uh, because high level was, you know, highly effect, affected by it, um, then they would they would work more on directing the emergency versus um, the emergency coordination center during Chuck Egg um, dealt with uh, you know keeping the, the community running, uh, supporting emergency services, uh, keeping the public informed, uh, and making those uh, higher level decisions than the tactical decisions on the ground. So on the emergency site, uh, that's where those tactical and and decisions are made on you know, where to put up sprinklers or uh, where to you know, berm things during a flood or where to pump things or how to get water and, and that kind of thing. So that's the difference between the ECC and the site. So uh, emergency social services uh, is probably the biggest job uh, during a major emergency. And uh, I know Ruth is on the line here, but this is the job that I definitely don't want. And uh, you know, it's probably the toughest uh, job out there because you're dealing with the human factor of the emergency. And, and their job is to manage evacuees, registration, displaced persons, care and feeding, clothing, um, mental health, uh, counseling, uh, relocation. There, there's so many things in emergency social services. And it's such a wide ranging uh, portion of our plan that it has its own plan within our plan. So um, it heavily relies on volunteers and uh, the, our staff do an amazing job at emergency social services. I mean, it's probably the portion of our plan that has been activated the most uh, in, the, uh, in the 18 years I've been working for the town. So uh, when we talk about evacuation centers, each community has a different evacuation center depending on the need. Um, our evacuation center is currently our arena. Um, the provincial emergency social services uh, will assist with coordinated resources. So they did last year when we send our people out, um, they can assist with coordinating uh, uh, evacuation centers in areas like Grand Prairie, Peace River, Slave Lake, and so on. Um, so once it reaches out of the borders of our standard mutual aid partners, that's when, when uh, PESS or PESS gets involved. So I'm gonna shift about the plan now and just talk about our risks. So um, we have had a risk assessment done uh, in the town. It's a few years old, but it really hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, our plan is with the new, um, uh, as we move forward with the DENE on, on hopefully a regional plan, um, we will be updating our risk assessment. But our largest hazard continues and always will be forest fires. Um, so um, high level is in and a wildland urban interface zone and is surrounded by trees. And uh, as long as we live where we live, we're gonna have a forest fire risk. Um, there's other natural hazards. Um, tornadoes have been known to occur up here. They just usually end up in the trees. Um, we have had earthquakes here, but although they've been minor and uh, other, uh, you know, winter storm is probably the other natural hazard that we have to worry about. Uh, Man-made hazards, utility failure is at the top of our list. Uh, then uh, the other two would be as materials events. We're on a major transportation corridor to the Northwest Territories and to the oil fields. 
So we have a lot of hazardous materials that come through our community every day, uh, both on rail and land. So that's probably one of our larger uh, highway or transportation risks, as well as a major fire. So Norboard, uh, the Norboard fire in 2016 was a good example of that. So how do we manage those? We have specific plans in our emergency plan for those risks. So we have a forest fire plan, we have a log yard plan, we have utility outage plan. There are very specific plans that gives us some very um, uh, specific directions with regards to um, things to think about within our plan. Um, it can't give you a step-by-step how-to manual because every incident is different, but it does lay out the resources and, uh, and uh, what, what we should be considering uh, for each type of those risks. So, uh, so these are the various plans that we have on how they're managed. Uh, we have an evacuation plan, a hazardous materials or dangerous goods support plan, hospital emergency support, seniors home evacuation, which will be changing with the new uh, seniors home, school support plan, environmental health pandemic plan. Um, and we also have um, the wildfire preparedness plan which is our largest and most extensive uh, spe spe site specific plan we have in our, in our MEP. So um, the wildfire preparedness guide uh, covers off, um, I know this is a little blurry, but that's kind of the back side of it. Um, we have two versions of this plan. So we have a field guide, which is what you're seeing right now, which is on a laminated 11 by 17 sheet um, that covers off all our values at risk and uh, some of the factors that we have to consider are auto, uh, auto order lists on what we need initially for equipment, uh, where our water supplies are, um, what communications we're using, how we communicate with forestry and so on. So that's uh, been updated since the Chuck Egg fire and we're doing a new update with uh, new radio stuff here uh, right away. But uh, that's the back side, and then the front side is a map. So um, the, we also have a, a full paper like book version of it as well that's in more detail. The other part of our wildfire preparedness plan is our sprinkler deployment plan. So we have two sprinkler deployment plans. You're seeing the one with the, it was called the no hydrant plan, which was um, basically, um, this is exactly what our sprinkler layout looked like during Chuck Egg. And um, we transitioned to the no hydrant plan on about day three, day four of the fire. Um, this, the hydranted plan is designed for quick deployment. Um, as council may remember, um, using hydrants in a wildfire emergency for sprinklers is not ideal because it goes through our water supply too quickly. And uh, so we transitioned to, uh, to a non hydrogen plan using 400 barrel tanks and portable tanks and ponds and so on. So this is what our plan looks like. Um, the back side of this sheet has all our water supply calculations and how many sprinklers and, and where we put lines and how many pumps we need and so on. So it's a pretty detailed um, portion of our MEP. And it worked well. Um, so, how are, so how are some of the other risks managed? A lot of our, our emergency plan, specifically on wildfire, is, um, is based on proactive risk management. So uh, Fire Smart Work, um, the FRIA program where we pull um, dollars for to do tree thinning and uh, fuels management. Um, we have control bylaws for hazmat control and burning control in our fire department bylaw. Obviously mutual aid agreements and prevention plans. As Councillor Welke mentioned earlier, the Northwest Alberta Emergency Response Agreement is part of those managing risks. Um, and then just simple um, things such as uh, promoting um, self-care and self-preparedness. So the 70, 72 hour kit, um, we're rolling out a lot of uh, fire smart uh, advice this, uh, this next few weeks on Facebook, um, so encouraging people to fire smart their own homes. Um, you know, being the 72, 72 hour prepare, preparedness guide is, uh, is a good uh, guide to make sure that our community is self-reliant for the first 72 hours. And then, uh, you know, all the messaging we're getting now with uh, with uh, COVID on hand washing and social distancing and so on, that's all, all part of risk management. So what, I want to take a second just to talk about the priorities in our plan. And every municipal emergency plan should have these four plan priorities. Uh, every plan that I've seen, it has these, these priorities listed in this order. So the, our first 
priority for our plan is always human life. And uh, uh, human life uh, dictates um, the, uh, the next uh, phase of our, of our plan, which is, is protecting critical infrastructure and property. So um, one could argue that critical infrastructure is property, it is. But when we're prioritizing a large incident, critical infrastructure starts such as hospitals, uh, water plants, uh, large facilities such as Toko and Norboard, um, you know, things that are key to, uh, key to the, keeping the community going are deemed first priority over homes. But um, definitely property is, is, uh, is the next step. Um, the last, not least important, but the last uh, out of the four is environment. So we look at the environment as well, and whenever we can mitigate uh, environmental hazards during an emergency, we will. So, um, so one of the things I wanted to bring up is just um, the municipality's role in in these four priorities. So obviously, human life, um, you know, that's that's the reason we have emergency services, and that's the reason we have a plan is to protect the lives of our community. Sometimes that always doesn't work. Um, you know, uh, you know, you look at. Um, disasters and uh, major emergencies across North America, um, California wildfires and, and so on, when those fires happen so quickly and they don't have time to get people out, they're, they're, they may not get past the first priority of just getting human life out of the way, and then they can look with the other ones. But certainly if you have time, then uh, the next, then, then we look at the other three, critical infrastructure, property and environment. So going through uh, the main parts of our plan, uh, so uh, we have a section that the section two is just covers our notifications of our staff and public. And this is our decision tree on, um, on how we decide what type it is and uh, how we make notifications. I'm not going to go through the detail with you, but it just gives you an idea of some of the things that are in our plan. It gives you a flow chart on kind of decision making. Um, our third section complaint uh, contains our main plan, including uh, contacts for council, um, Alberta Emergency Management Agency, um, our agency members, essential personnel, mutual aid, other resources, and so on. And uh, we also have a resource uh, plan in there that's updated annually. So in those resources have a list of contractors, um, heavy equipment, uh, where we find people, um, uh, different, uh, you know, definitely uh, restaurants and feeding and all that kind of stuff is in our resource plan. And that's up, updated once a year. So we're just starting to finish that update. We're a little bit behind because of the COVID stuff, but that's uh, usually a spring thing that we, uh, that we go through and update. So I talked a little bit earlier about the staff roles, but I wanted to get into some of the main staff, um, or sorry, not main staff, but some of the senior roles uh, that, we, uh, that we talk about. So the DAM, which is the Director of Emergency Management Operationally is in charge of the ECC and is the overall decision maker in an emergency. So um, our dam is our CAO. It always has been as part of our plan with the, with the town. And the dam, um, not much different than day-to-day -day operations as the CAO, uh, is the overall decision maker. Um, so uh, he doesn't get down into the weeds in terms of tactical decisions, but he's the, the 50,000 foot level decision maker. And uh, he's the one that makes those, helps make those decisions to, um, you know, uh, approve resources and, uh, and get, Hire, bring in the big guns and so on like we did last year. Our senior staff, uh, including all the ones that are in this meeting today, um, their roles are based on expertise. So, you know, we're probably gonna put somebody like Carolyn in charge of finance and somebody like Keith in charge of operations and, and public works and assuring that our areas of expertise are managed properly. Um, and uh, so a big, th a big uh, positive about our staff is we know uh, where we're best suited and uh, we all work well together. So, um, you know, we can uh, fit into our roles quite quickly and uh, get things uh, get things rolling with our staff. And then the other staff, as I mentioned earlier, are used in various roles, whether those support roles, response roles, um, uh, you know, that could be anywhere from administrative right into on the ground assistance. So um, they vary from time to time. So this is uh, a fully expanded uh, organizational chart of, of an emergency. And, and quite honestly, uh, during Chuck Egg, we had a lot of this filled. Um, it was not all filled with our town staff. We used an incident management team to assist us with that, but definitely we had uh, various um, roles filled 
Uh, the larger the emergency gets, uh, the more people we have in there. And, uh, you know, certainly we had people in most of the areas in the operations section. Um, planning was fully filled, um, logistics fully filled, and admin was fully filled for most of Chuck Egg last year. Um, some of that was filled by forester staff, some of that was filled by the regional incident management teams, and some of it was filled by our town staff. But there was definitely um, uh, people in most of those roles. So at the very top, you see the agency executive, which is the mayor um, and council, and um, they uh, are going to talk about your roles right away. So, so where does council fit into the plan? So the mayor is the official spokesperson for the town. Um, so we basically get to put the mayor front and center and she speaks uh, for the community. Um, there's times where that duty is delegated to senior staff regarding specific areas responsibility. Um, last year that was um, you know, commonly done with uh, both the incident commanders, myself, um, other staff that uh, needed to uh, deal with specific issues. Uh, we dealt with sometimes with the media, but generally the mayor is the official spokesperson. So that's one of the roles of council. Um, if the mayor is not available, it just goes down as per your council uh, procedures and it goes to the deputy mayor or the acting mayor after that and, and so on. So other duties include chairing meetings of council and making requests to the province as required. Sometimes uh, certain requests re need to come from uh, elected leadership versus administration. So, um, so that's where council fits in. Uh, notifying and briefing council on the emergency situation. Declaring local states of emergency is a council responsibility um, that usually comes at the uh, recommendation of the DEM. Um, and taking necessary actions to meet emergency response requirements. So that may be, you know, approving an emergency budget or um, doing a request to the province for, for assistance and so on. So uh, that's kind of where council fits into the plan. So they're not the operational on the ground decision makers. Um, they look at um, where the DEM may look at the 50,000 foot level, the council looks at the 100,000 foot level and looks um, and, and helps uh, you know, keep our citizens informed of what's happening and, uh, and works to make sure that, uh, that this, the staff can manage the emergency properly. So some of the other duties, uh, approving press releases and public service announcements are sometimes uh, brought to uh, council, some, most often the mayor in some of those, uh, some of those situations, uh, declaring a termination of local state of emergency. Um, so, so, so what, just as you declare it, some, we have to terminate it as well. So I'll talk about when they automatically terminate, but sometimes, uh, we decide the emergency is over before the, uh, the legislated expiry date is so we can terminate it. And then also arranging, um, special council meetings to discuss recommendations on the fire or on the, uh, sorry, the emergency itself. Um, so when we talk about a declaration, of a state of a local emergency. This decision is based on a recommendation from the EOC and notifying uh, members of council in the Alberta Emergency Management Agency. So once we declare, we uh, all the members of council has to be notified, AEMA has to be notified, and we have to make a public notification as well that an emergency is state of local emergency is declared. You have to remember that declaring a soul um, comes with a lot of uh, powers, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. So the public has to be aware of that change in law. So we have to ensure that they're aware of that decision. Um, so some of the things that happen or reasons we could declare a state of a local emergency is uh, inadequacy of legal authority to deal with the situation. So that may mean, you know, we don't have uh, authority to move people away from their homes or uh, cordon off an area or, um, you know, those types of things. Uh, we might need that extraordinary legal authority. Um, a general warning for the population, notification to other governments that we're, uh, we're in, a, in an emergency could be all reasons for declaration. Um, to declare a resolution, we need a resolution of council. Um, the mayor or two councillors is sufficient um, to complete the declaration. We do not need all of council there. We don't even need a quorum. We just need the mayor or two councillors. Uh, we need to ensure the declaration is recorded in the minutes and a complete the, uh, uh, the public announcement form, publish the announcement, and we usually done by radio before the copy to the minister through AEMA. And then we also have to let the minister know uh, when, we, um, when we terminate. So uh, 
a local state of emergency is automatically terminated after seven days unless it's renewed. Uh, right now during COVID, if we declare a state of emergency specific to COVID, it's, uh, it's uh, in place for 90 days until we cancel it. So um, that's one of the changes that was made this year. So a state of emergency allows us certain authorities and that's uh, some of those authorities include the ability to conscript, uh, force evacuations, fix pricing on goods. We can enter buildings or structures that warrant and provide for restoration of essential services and facilities. So as I mentioned before, our ECC is located in the program room of the town office. Uh, the backup is the fire hall. It's a really old picture of our fire hall, but um, both are set up with backup power and uh, full lines and so on. So um, the program room in the council chamber or program room in the town office um, have backup phone lines, both analog and digital. And then we have some extra analog phone lines at the fire hall as well. Um, we have radios available at the fire hall to communicate back and forth, but they're limited for the radios that we have and they're usually used by emergency services. But uh, as you saw last year, um, the Alberta first responders radio communication system has surge capacity for radios. And last year they brought up almost 400 radios for emergency responders um, within a few days, as well as uh, extra towers to, um, to uh, uh, assist with communication. So they're a great resource and they're, they're organized through Alberta Emergency Management. Um, normal communications are usually done through our dispatch center in Grand Prairie, but during a major emergency as such as we did last year, um, communications would be uh, set up locally so we can exclude our dispatch center from overwhelming them and, uh, and we can uh, run our own communication. So we did that last year here. We ran a communication center out of the fire station. Um, for site communications, our regional hazmat unit acts as a mobile command center. And uh, we've had situations where we've had uh, ICs or incident commanders, site managers working from that unit at a major emergency. It has radios, phones, its own email, Wi-Fi, and so on. So uh, we have that capability to run a scene right from that truck. And we definitely did that during uh, some incidents at Norboard and, and some other incidents around as well. And that, that works good for a short period of time. We have other communications tools available to us uh, for the public. Um, we have the Alberta Emergency Alert System, Facebook, Twitter, and our town website. Um, one of the things that we do purposely, and this is a planning event or planning uh, function as an example, um, talk specifically about Facebook is um, the fire department itself uses the town Facebook page as many fire departments across the province, you have their own Facebook pages. We choose not to, so we direct all our, our community to the town Facebook page um, and uh, then they know where to go during an emergency. And that was quite effective last year. Our Facebook page was a main source of information for, for, the, for the public. Our media center is our council chambers. Uh, press conferences would be held there if required. Um, last year, um, the size of the emergency, we end up uh, moving our media briefings to other areas of the town and uh, we're gonna be incorporating some of that information into our uh, media plan for the next update of our plan. And uh, as we found out, we're not immune to media as we thought we were. Um, we used to think that it's only our local paper and radio that we have to worry about. And uh, it was within a day we had, uh, we had media up here for uh, quite some time. So uh, it, once they got here, they did, uh, didn't leave for several weeks. Um, here's just a list of when we've had ECC evacu uh, activations. So Fox Lake in 20, 2003, as well as Keg River, we had our emergency exercise in 2004. We activated our ECC for that. We had utility failures in 2008 and we evacuated Zama in 2008 and uh, the Kedzie County fires in 2012. 2015, uh, the wildfires, we had uh, emergency social services in our operations section uh, set up. We had the Norbert fire in 2016, as well as we had flooding in 2016 in town, a gas supply interruption in 2018, and our Chuckay Creek wildfire, of course, in 2019. So you can see that we're pretty active with regards to um, our emergency operations center, emergency coordination center, and our town emergency plan. Um, when I went through this list, I didn't realize how busy we actually were, but um, we activate our plan more often than we think. So um, almost done. Uh, where does the province fit in? Uh, the province provides support and coordination to municipal plans. They are a large presence in our recovery phase um, and they have some on ground resources. So, um, so the ground resources are usually field officers 
um, and they come and provide assistance. Um, they also have the ability to dispatch uh, the incident management teams as well. So they have a provincial operations center, the POC, and that's where they, they coordinate. So right now the POC is uh, fully manned at its highest level because of COVID. Um, and they were very well manned during Chuck Egg last year because of all the other fires that were happening. I think they were at level three out of four levels last year. Right now they're at level four. Um, again, uh, they can assist with the deployment of uh, regional HIMTs. That was highly success successful uh, last year. Uh, and that was the first time that team has been deployed. We had elements of the team go to McKenzie County just a week or so ago as well when they assisted McKenzie County with some of their uh, management of the flood after the flood hit four for a million. And that's it. So um, tried to breeze through it because I know we have a short period of time during the council meeting, but hope uh, that was uh, good information for council. I'm going to stop the share and go back to the video. If there's any questions, I'm uh, still online. Is there any questions from council? I have a comment. Sure, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Rodney, for that, that uh, presentation. I found it extremely informative, uh, especially from a municipal elected official point of view, as well as a resident. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy that due to live streaming of this meeting that the public can watch that. Um, and I hope too that our uh, neighboring um, governing bodies, you know, take away a lot from this presentation as well. It looks like, you know, a very, uh, um, comprehensive plan that we have and I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. So thank you. thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation, Chief Schmidt. It was very informative and like Jan said, I hope everybody took something away from it. Is there any other questions, comments? Okay, um, seeing none, we'll move on to the RFP or cancellation of bookings, CAO? Uh, Madam Mayor, just for the next several, as, as because these meetings are online, you can go directly to the director who has submitted the uh, RFP. Okay. So that would be Ruth in this case. Okay. Ms. Rolf? Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as, uh, as you know, that uh, we've been in a public health emergency since mid-March and uh, had come to Council um, back in April as far as cancellations for direction um, due to the fact that uh, mass gatherings were limited um, as, as well as our recreation facilities being closed. Um, I had included in, the, in this report uh, Alberta's relaunch policy and uh, I should um, mention that uh, today as well on uh, the Alberta Biz Connection that there is uh, new guidelines for guidance for day camps, outdoor recreation, farmer's market, museum. Um, I still suggest that we uh, would go forward and uh, cancel our events and bookings um, until July 2nd to cover July 1st because it doesn't uh, look like we're going to have uh, mass gatherings are going to be changing before then. Um, possibly council may look at wanting us to come back um, with the uh, Committee of the Whole and uh, do some discussion on if we want to do some sort of um, uh, some programming around the day camps and uh, the museum possibly in June with the, uh, uh, the restrictions are, they're still there, but they're a little bit less. So, um, so I just thought I would let you know about that as well too. Any questions or? What was the, what was the, decision around uh, mark, uh, markets, farmers markets? Um, they're, uh, they're okay to open uh, like starting this Thursday. There's um, some restrictions on distancing and, um, and that sort of thing, uh, as you might well expect, um, but they're, they're okay to go, so to speak. I guess in our case, we'd have to look at a different setup because we had been renting the um, the arena, so you have to look at a different area, maybe just stri strictly outside, but they, uh, they are suggesting that they could move forward. Okay, any questions from council? Could I have someone make a... Uh, 
I'll make a motion uh, with alternative number one. Sorry, I guess the mayor is temporarily unavailable or there she's back. I'm back. <laughs> so could I have a motion from council? I'll make the motion for alternative number one. Okay, thank you, Councillor Anderson. All in favor? Carried. The next one is also with Ms. Rolfe and it is the Banner of Remembrance Committee. Okay, so um, we, uh, when we had the task force, um, one of the recommendations was to continue on with uh, a committee. Um, there is attached uh, to your package the uh, terms of reference. Basically, um, we're suggesting that uh, council appoints the current members of the task force to stand and um, have the option to remain on for uh, an additional year before we put it out for public invitation. Um, yeah, so unless there's any questions. Is there any questions for Ms. Rowe? Okay, could I have someone make a motion then, please? So moved. Councillor Forrest, all in favor? Carried. The next one is for the Remembrance Program, uh, Banner of Remembrance Program, goes to Ms. Rolf as well. Oh yeah, we're excited. Uh, we're all ready to roll out the program. Um, I have had communication with um, both the finance, uh, the director of finance and our communications uh, officer and um, we're, we're ready to roll for June 1st. Um, the uh, forms are attached. There might be some minor changes, but uh, basically I've gone through everything with finance, with the procedures and how we can do everything, talk about the sponsorship program. And uh, we're, uh, I have gone to three different companies for um, the uh, banners and uh, have uh, different quotes and they're all fairly close to what council had uh, looked at for design. So I would, uh, I would say we're, we're ready to go. We just need a resolution. That's very exciting. So is there any questions of Ms. Rolfe on the Banner of Remembrance program? If not, could I have someone make a recommend a resolution then please? Deputy Mayor, all in favor? Carried. Um, the next one goes to CAO and it's uh, because I'm building a new fence, I want a new fence. No, kidding. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, this <laughs> I was going to introduce this by this arose out of a conversation the two of us had. Um, <laughs> so, uh, which I, I will let you take the idea and just discuss it with council. What we've done is looking at an incentive uh, for some fence repairs in the town um, and we've given a couple of options but I think Madam Mayor would probably be best uh, if you explain the concept. Uh, so in discussion, well I've been doing a lot of walking and there are a lot of people that are fixing their fences but there are a lot of fences that should be fixed so we thought we might come up with Am I frozen again? Oh, nope. so we thought maybe we could come up with an incentive program since people um, aren't going anywhere that perhaps um, they can uh, fix their fence, paint them, um, redo the whole thing, fix portions of it and uh, be able to enter their name into a draw Now I think she froze. All right, I'll temporarily uh, assume the child or she's back again. <laughs> Just back. I think I'm back again. <laughs> yes. Sorry. So yes, no, I won't enter the program if we go ahead with it. <laughs> so our, our idea was what we put forward, uh, Council, is the 
is to look at five five hundred dollar um, rewards or uh, draw uh, prizes. And what we would encourage, or the way we are envisioning it, be set up is to do before and after pictures of any um, eligible fence revitalization, which could be replacement, repair, uh, of course, painting, anything to spruce up the fence. And what we would do is reimburse the $500 based on receipts from any local merchant. So if they want to use it to buy groceries or gas, as long as they bring in the receipts, we would reimburse the $500. So we put it forward for council's discussion. So any discussion? Do you like? I think it's a great idea. Hopefully we'll get some people that'll take advantage of it. How many, how many, it's Councillor Jessman, how many were we gonna be drawing for? Was it four again? Five, five hundred dollars. Okay. So twenty five hundred bucks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I'm all for it. I think it'll be good for local businesses and uh, uh, at the same time spruce up our community. Is there any other discussion? If not, could we have a motion? Councillor Anderson? Yes, I'll make the motion uh, as alternative number one. Okay. All in favor of that motion? Opposed, if any? Okay, carried. All right, Madam Mayor, we'll get that rolled out this week. Thank you very much. Um, correspondence for information. Does someone want to receive for information or do you wish to discuss it? I'll move it for information. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. All in favor? Carried. And that is the end of our council meeting this evening. Could I have someone move to adjourn us? So moved. Councillor Morgan, all in favor? Carrie, see you all next week.